Hello and welcome to a new episode of Mind Expanding Russian or the guy who continues to talk about psychedelics and other strange topics but today I'm going to talk to you about mescaline or mescal and there may be a dog appearing in a frame at some point in time I guess there, there, there she is yeah, so she demands attention she's been sleeping for a while and now she wants uh, to get a good scratch on her head right don't you so yeah masculine or mescal what's the difference uh, and again it is an theogen along with a other come on Sherry <laughs> so <clears throat> How did masculine appear? Actually, masculine been there for thousands of years and actually even more than thousands of years, I guess, tens of thousands of years or even millions of years. But the known, the known relationship with humans uh, between masculine and humans has been documented according to the archaeological discoveries for over 5,000 years so far. And there are other aspects to it but before we dig into it let's take a step back and make sure that everybody knows what we're talking about so why all of a sudden am i talking about masculine there are a few reasons first um i've recently read a nice book by michael pollan called this is your mind on plants which is pretty good i uh, highly advise that uh, at, in this book he talks about three particular plants coffee poppy and cacti particular cacti which has masculine as an active ingredient in it which is mostly known as a psychedelic ingredient or psychedelic molecule or however you want to call it but before going there <clears throat> i will talk about his book which is great before going there we need to take uh, another step back and go towards the middle of 20th century and there are certain people whom I've mentioned before already namely ha Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond and I wanted to combine them and say uh, Aldous Omford <laughs> shit I don't know fucked it up anyway so uh, you know them from before but just to quickly reiterate so Aldous Huxley's Aldous Huxley is known for his literature genius in a sense or some books that he wrote and one of them is called brave new world which is dystopia by genre and the other guy is humphrey osman if i remember correctly is british canadian psychotherapist so they've been exchanging mails back in the day and discussing various types of psychedelics and in more details they've been focusing on masculine Due to various reasons, because uh, their interest got piqued at some point in time by discoveries of other people. At some point in time during their conversation over mail exchange, they've tried to discuss in more details the substance and the effect of it on the human's mind. And back in the day, a more known word was used to describe psychedelics. It was called psychotomimetic or mimicking psychosis basically so the idea there was that when person takes that substance molecule whatever such person is in a state of deep psycho not deep just in a state of psychosis meaning that person is mental in a sense or crazy or however you call it but yeah psychosis is a term that is widely used in psychiatry mainly in cases where people lose connection with reality and have a very hard conditions only some of them that i know of like schizophrenia for instance or something else but not only so back in the day psychotomimetic was the term that was used to describe those substances and in their mail exchange they tried to nail a better one and actually humphrey osmond came up with a new one called psychedelic which is translated as mind manifesting this is a word that was created by him because it didn't exist before that and when he went to a conference back in 1956 to talk about 
the substances, he introduced the term psychedelic. And still, by this day, we use that term. Although, I do prefer term entheogens, because that word is slightly different in terms of perception and in terms of how people relate to it. Because when you say psychedelic, people may think, oh, those druggies, addicts, and whatnot. When you say entheogens, it sounds mysterious, in a sense. It kind of intrigues and piques the interest. So, they've nailed the term, and at some point in time, they've also nailed a really nice phrase, which sounds to fathom hell or go evangelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. And this is a really interesting way to put it, because entheogens do affect our human psyche and in a very interesting ways. So, what it says is that you can either go to hell or go to heaven when you are on entheogens. But the thing is that it's never predictable. It is impossible to know upfront what type of experience are you going to have. And even if you have fully prepared yourself in terms of the set and setting and other aspects that I've discussed before in my previous episodes, there is no 100% guarantee that it's going to be all good and positive and interesting and insightful. Due to various reasons, and one of them is the peculiarities of human psyche. So, for example, if you've had any trauma, and I'm not talking about like necessarily severe trauma, whether it's physical or mental, I'm talking about some hard things that happen in your childhood, they may rise up when your mind is on entheogens. And if you're not prepared to deal with it, you may experience a difficult trip. But if you take all the um, safety measures in place, and if you integrate the experience, it's not all that bad, because 90% of people who did experience a difficult trip after that said that it was quintessential and yeah, essential for their life and help them to reevaluate some of the aspects. So they didn't regret it in the thinking afterwards having it. So let's not deviate too far away and talk about masculine because this is the topic that I've uh, opened up with. I'm gonna try and stick to that topic. So masculine has a long story of relationships between human <laughs> with humans. There are some people who were responsible for identifying the specific cacti or the specific ingredient, the molecule that is the active substance in it, masculine. In 1897, Arthur Hefter, not Hefner, he, German pharmacologist, wait a second, the second German pharmacologist, so there was Albert Hoffman, there's this Arthur Hefter. Hmm, those Germans. Anyway, oh, that one, the Swiss guy, right. So, going back to Arthur Hafter. So, in 1897, he synthesized mescaline, which is the active ingredient in a cacti called peyote. Peyote is a cacti. And it is known uh, to the world because of some <laughs> reasons. Not only the psychedelic renaissance that is happening, but also there, were, there have been some interesting cultural phenomena like Carlos Castaneda, which I don't actually know if it is a real person or not, and to what extent the imagination played part in all those books. There's like a dozen of those books or something. I remember reading like three or four or five of them. And yeah, I was impressed back in the day, but it was like 12, 20 or so years ago. So, going back to the cacti, peyote is the most known cacti that has masculine in it. There are other cacti, or cacta, cacta, in Russian I'd say cactus, yeah, that's it. So, there is San Pedro cacti that also has masculine. And I'm gonna try and pr pronounce properly the genus here, Echionopsis or Trichocereus. This is the genesis, or, sorry. Genus, right. Then specific species that are quite notable are Pachanoi, 
and Peruviana, also known as Huachuma in the context of South American ritual shamanic consumption. Why those cactuses have masculine in it? And probably it is one of the defense mechanisms against animals, against human beings as well, probably, because if you try it, I haven't tried it yet, but I should. If you try it, it is very bitter and the taste repels a person or not necessarily a person being to consume it further because, you know, you'd rather spit it than chew it or swallow. So going back to Michael Pollan's book, the interesting thing about his book is that he tried to kind of draw a line between plants that are prohibited and plants that are not. And talking about the first one, so coffee, I'm going to do a real quick dive here about coffee. So coffee basically is dominating in terms of the plant-human relationship. Coffee made people work for it. Coffee made people live on it. Basically, it is a drug. Right? So you do consume coffee. I do consume caffeine through consumption of this particular type of tea. And you can find caffeine not only in um, tea, of course, it is in coffee, or Arabica and Robusta, but also in other elements and natural plants like cocoa beans or cocoa, or I don't know how to pronounce it properly. Anyway, you get what I'm saying here. But nowadays, caffeine can be found in the carbonated soft drinks and not only. So people typically start the day, and when I say people, I'm not referring to the entire humankind. I do understand that, of course, it is culturally different depending on where you are. But let's say the widely known Western world, which you can observe through the TV shows, movies, and, you know, other aspects of it. Books like Michael Pollan. So people consume heavily coffee, and of course, it is widely known there are big empires built on that plant, namely Starbucks, just to give you one, and there are, of course, many others. So coffee is legal, and it is absolutely normal to consume coffee, although coffee is a psychoactive substance. Same as poppy, which is less known as a plant, but more known as a very dangerous drug of abuse, or the active ingredient or molecule, or the active ingredient opium, which is prohibited and mainly produced in uh, Afghanistan and then supplied to other countries and big pharmaceutical companies that use it to put people on drugs using totally legal prescription drugs that has opium in it, variations of opiates. So, you know, some things are like completely legal, some things are like, yeah, barely legal, but if you try to grow poppies and then try to make something out of it, like poppy tea, it could be 100% legal, you can go to jail. In some countries, probably it's gonna be even harsher, I don't know, depending on where you are, please don't do it. Always remember, there's a law and there's your physical body that is still there, unless you're downloaded in the machine already. Yeah, going back. So... Masculine or peyote, the cacti that is uh, again prohibited and it, you can find it in parts of North America, southern parts of North America, Central America and Southern America. So there are locations in Mexico, in United States and other countries where you can find it growing in kind of natural habitat. I hope they say that word. Anyway, so... You can find that cacti, and that cacti looks differently. I mean, depending on which species we're talking about here. So you can find and Google it, but the idea there is that yeah, you, you shouldn't try eat it or chew it. It's, it's not like other plants, like marijuana, which you can basically take off a bush and fire it up and then inhale smoke. Don't do it, of course, because in some cases, in the majority of them, it's gonna be illegal, which always puzzled me. So for instance, in northern parts of India, you can just go along the road, like a highway road, and there are two meter weed plants growing alongside the road. So technically they are prohibited, so you cannot consume it or, of course, sell it or hold it or store it, something like that, but there it is, <laughs> grows next to the road. So it is a weed, right, Mary Jane? 
Good old Mary Jane. But yeah, going back to the cacti, with peyote, the situation is totally different. You cannot just take a bite and hope that you're gonna fly to the next dimension. It's not gonna happen. It requires a certain way of preparation, which is quite long. So it's basically cooking a cacti stew and then consuming it. But of course, nowadays you can find a chemically produced one. And, you know, since 1897, things have changed. But, you know, even if back in the day they were able to synthesize it, nowadays, I guess, it is possible to do it as well. And the reason why I'm talking about synthetical version of mescaline is that the natural one is supposed to be protected by law because of church, basically. So there is a church of Native Americans in India. I want to say in India. Native Americans, typically known as Indians, and please forgive me if I pronounce it incorrectly. I'm from a different cultural background. There's no offense in here, but anyway. So they were suppressed by, you know, people from Europe that came at some point in time to try and uh, conquer the new world and then make all people obey their laws and orders and whatnot. So they suppressed them. But in the beginning of 20th century, a church emerged in Northern America called Native American Church. And that church allowed itself use masculine as part of their religious practice. The reason I'm talking about is that with the recent interest towards entheogens, psychedelics, masculine in particular, there are a lot of people who want to go and try it out that mysterious substance and experience whatever Aldous Huxley experienced and tried to write in his book Doors of Perception. So it hurts people, Native American Indians, Native Americans. Shit, I don't know which way is like correct way to pronounce it, but anyway. So they've been practicing for thousands of years and then then been oppressed by white people and then white people are coming back with the interest and the desire to take the cacti from their hands and from their ritual from their culture so of course it is better to avoid you know further exploitation of native uh, people who've been using the substance for thousands of years and stick to the synthetic version of it so again the reason I'm talking about it is that it is one of the entheogens and I want to talk about it. <laughs> Secondly is that it's been used in the healing for the millennia by people of various regions of American continents. So it has power, it has potential and it can heal, it can cure people of various diseases. But not only that, it helps establish the connection between humans and nature. It lasts from 6 to 10 hours, well, at least to the best of my knowledge, or the information that I got from UC Berkeley's Psychedelics and the Mind. And of course, it requires preparation, as well as set and setting that were mentioned to you before. So I'm not going to go into details, but then again, it is one of those intuitions that you, can, you cannot just come consume and, you know, take a trip. Unlike psilocybin mushrooms or THC, marijuana or LSD or other variations. Although I wouldn't recommend anybody just popping acid and tripping. It's, it can be quite dangerous if you're unprepared, so be mindful. Prepare, do your homework, understand what exactly you're consuming, blah, blah, blah. It was in my previous episode. If you want to go into details, just go there. I've talked about it in a lot of details. But, again, going back to masculine, I think I've covered the topic or not. Yeah, mescal. <laughs> Almost forgot the question I asked at the beginning. Masculine or mescal? So, mescal was an invention in a way to divert people's attention from masculine and... Uh, cacti so that people won't pick it up and use it in their own goals let's say that mezcal is a variation of tequila basically which is created out of agave and there are different types of agave and agave is the 
plant that is being I don't know what's the proper word here, but it's a plant like variation of the cacti, I guess. So anyway, it is used to create a kila. It is also used to create mescal, but different type of agave, if I remember correctly, is the blue one. So at some point in time, somebody decided to let's call it to call. At some point in time, somebody decided to call it mescal, so that people start to associate it with mescaline, and you know, slightly lose interest because it's just another type of alcohol. Nothing special about it. By the way, alcohol is completely normalized. Surprise, surprise. But in Russia, just to give you an idea of the dangers of the alcohol, and there are, of course, and there is a lot of information in terms of toxicity and the dangers of alcohol, especially in comparison with entheogens. But from my cultural background in Russia, there is a period in New Year, Actually, typically, it's the first 10 days of New Year where the country is closed, basically, and people just get hammered and stab each other. So, throughout the year, this is the highest period of uh, homicide. Yeah. Or domestic violence or, you know, somebody killing somebody because they've been drinking a lot of vodka and then deciding to argue with each other and kill each other with something. So... This is alcohol, but alcohol is like completely normal. You can go to the store and buy it, but entheogens are illegal. Hmm. I've never heard of a situation when somebody got high. Like, have you ever heard of any like real situation? Not imaginary one, not, you know, bullshit created by somebody like factual situation where somebody got high on Mary Jane and then decided to stab somebody or not necessarily stab or kill somebody in a different manner I think it's just not possible same for masculine probably but I haven't tried it I don't know but I can definitely say that if you're an LSD you wouldn't want to kill somebody that's for sure you're probably going to experience your own death <laughs> rather than killing somebody. And the only somebody whom you'll probably kill is yourself. <laughs> Not literally. It It is the concept of ego death that I'm talking about here. Don't worry about it. You're not going to die if you're masculine. By the way, there is no lethal dose of entheogens. Shock, right? Unlike alcohol. <laughs> uh, anyway... I'm going to wrap up here, so thank you for watching, hopefully, and uh, yeah, I guess next time I'll talk about something different. Maybe MDMA. Maybe not. I don't know. Thank you for watching, and until next time.